This is a video discussion on antidysrhythmic drug toxicity, corresponding to Chapter 57 in Goldfrank's Toxicologic Emergencies. The chapter starts out by defining and differentiating between antidysrhythmic and antiarrhythmic, and obviously makes a choice. But I'm letting you know that I'll be using these terms interchangeably, and this isn't intended to be any kind of editorial statement or have any deeper meaning. I usually enjoy arguing semantics, but I'm taking a pass on this one. The learning objective here is that you're going to find almost everything I want you to know about antidysrhythmics in other videos created or curated for this clinical toxicology series. There's a considerable amount of content overlap among the cardiovascular chapters and topics, especially when a chapter about the toxicity of a drug class is immediately followed by the chapter detailing an antidote to treat that toxicity. And the order in which I created these videos was arbitrary, just based on my whims on any given day, so if a topic has been covered well in another video I already made, I'm really trying to limit the amount of repetition here. But this video will at least provide some additional structure to the concepts covered about toxicity involving the cardiac action potential. It was these two guys, Brahma Singh and Miles Vaughn Williams, who introduced what we now consider the classic antiarrhythmic classification system in the early 1970s. Class 1 agents are sodium channel blockers, class 2 are beta blockers, class 3 are potassium channel blockers, and class 4 are calcium channel blockers. The toxicities of these drug classes are covered in other videos, either created or curated for this clinical toxicology course. For the class 1 and class 3 antiarrhythmics, these are in videos I've already made about their primary pharmacologic antidotal therapies, while the class 2 and class 4 drugs are covered in videos I found on YouTube created by others. And I didn't just choose these videos randomly, I watched a whole lot of YouTube to find just a few gems made by others that I think are of high quality and content. So much so, that it probably isn't worthwhile for me to record my own version, since it will amount to essentially the same thing. As a general overview, the different antidysrhythmic drug classes have effects on different parts of the cardiac action potential. The class 1 sodium channel blockers affect depolarization in phase 0. The class 2 beta blockers affect phase 4, making it take longer for the next depolarization to occur. Class 3 drugs block potassium efflux that triggers repolarization in phase 3 of the action potential, and class 4 calcium channel blockers block, well, calcium channels. And while it's true that calcium ion influx is part of the phase 2 plateau, Blocking this effect here isn't how calcium channel blockers exert their antiarrhythmic effect, as we'll see in the next slide. The figures here show each class's effect on the cardiac action potential. Class 1 sodium channel blockers decrease the slope of rapid depolarization, resulting in a widening of the QRS on the surface EKG. Beta blockers decrease the slope of phase 4, here shown in the action potential of a pacemaker cell, making it take longer before the next depolarization occurs, resulting in bradycardia and lowering the blood pressure. Class 3, potassium efflux blockade, delays repolarization, prolonging the QT interval, and here we see that the class 4 calcium channel blockers, like beta blockers, are also antiarrhythmic at the pacemaker cells, prolonging the time it takes before the next beat occurs. This slide summarizes the treatment options for toxic effects of the various antidysrhythmic classes. Some of these should already be obvious, since I've already referred you to the videos about their primary pharmacologic antidotes, like how sodium bicarbonate is the primary treatment for sodium channel blockade. There are many potential options to treat beta blocker toxicity, which I've characterized here as kitchen sink therapy, as in throw everything at it but the kitchen sink. Those treatments for which there's a specific video in this series are highlighted in blue, not necessarily because these are the first or the best modalities, but for your reference to remind you to watch those videos next if you haven't already. These options include glucagon, high-dose insulin, euglycemia therapy, and lipid emulsion therapy. Magnesium is used to treat torsade de pointe, but it might also be treated with overdrive electrical pacing or overdrive beta agonist pacing with isoproteranol. And here are some more similarities between beta blocker and calcium channel blocker poisoning. Kitchen sink therapy can also be indicated here, although glucagon is much more specific for beta blockers. And the rest of the discussion here will repeat portions of the videos about sodium bicarbonate for sodium channel blockade and the use of magnesium to treat torsade, so if you've already watched those videos I created, you can stop here at no loss. Okay, you're still here, so I will continue. 
We're going to be looking at cardiotoxicity from fast sodium channel blockade using the example of tricyclic antidepressants, or TCAs. So you'll recognize the graph on the top as the cardiac action potential, and the lower graph as the corresponding EKG tracing. The black lines here are the normal state in the absence of sodium channel blockade. We see that normally the depolarization in phase zero is very rapid. Sodium is rushing into cells along its electrochemical gradient through the voltage-gated sodium channels. And this corresponds on the EKG to a fast, or narrow, QRS complex. But in the presence of sodium channel blockers, the influx of sodium is impaired, decreasing the slope of phase zero in individual cardiac cells, and manifesting on the EKG as a widening of the QRS complex. Now, if we want to consider the spectrum of cardiac effects we'll see with increasing TCA toxicity, the first thing will be a sinus tachycardia from their anti-muscarinic effects, counteracting the normal amount of vagal tone on the cardiac pacemaker. Then, as the amount of sodium channel blockade increases, the QRS will widen. And if it widens far enough, the patient can develop ventricular tachycardia, or worse. But since these changes occur along a spectrum, we may be able to detect sodium channel blockade and start to treat it before malignant arrhythmias develop. And this is why getting an EKG is a good idea in an overdose patient, looking for evidence of sodium channel blockade that you probably wouldn't detect any other way. This slide shows the EKG changes seen with sodium channel blockade. This particular EKG is from a patient I saw who overdosed on diphenhydramine, an over-the-counter antihistamine that causes sodium channel blockade at higher doses. And we see QRS widening. The QRS duration here is 120 milliseconds with normal being 80 to 100 milliseconds. And there is an atypical morphology of the QRS complex that's best seen in lead AVR. Normally, all of the deflections from the isoelectric line in AVR are downward. But here, there is a significant portion the latter portion of the QRS complex that appears above the isoelectric line. This morphology has been described in several ways, but they're all describing the same phenomenon. With sodium channel blockade, the right bundle tends to be blocked more than the left, so the depolarization towards the right is more delayed. Normally, the right and left sides of the heart depolarize at the same time, and since the muscle mass of the left is so much larger, we never see the rightward depolarization on a surface EKG. But in the presence of sodium channel blockers, the left side depolarizes first. And if there's enough delay in right-sided depolarization, we'll now be able to see it occur immediately afterward. And AVR is the lead where this is best observed, since it's a lead over the right side of the heart. AVR for right. This sodium channel blockade can be treated with hypertonic sodium bicarbonate. And there are two independent mechanisms for this. The first mechanism relates to the sodium. The bicarb solution we are giving is hypertonic, increasing the serum sodium concentration. This increases the chemical gradient of sodium across the membrane, favoring sodium influx during depolarization, so in effect, overcoming some of the sodium channel blockade. It would be possible to simply give hypertonic sodium chloride to help overcome sodium channel blockade by the same mechanism. But using sodium bicarbonate allows us to also use another mechanism. The binding of sodium channel blocking drugs to the sodium channels is pH dependent, and they tend to bind better at a lower serum pH. Giving bicarbonate a base increases the pH to decrease binding to and blocking of the sodium channels. And here again, it would be possible to use a different pH buffering agent than sodium bicarb to raise the pH, but why not use sodium bicarb to take advantage of both mechanisms at once? Class three antiarrhythmics, and many other drugs, can delay cardiac repolarization, prolonging the QT interval. When the QT interval is prolonged, this increases the likelihood of a cell developing an early after depolarization that might trigger torsade. Torsade de pointe is French for twisting of the points, which describes the EKG pattern of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, where the depolarization vector keeps changing, making the EKG tracing look like a twisted party streamer ribbon. Torsade de pointe does not stick around indefinitely, it's paroxysmal. And as we see here, it can occur in short runs, reverting back to a sinus rhythm. But even when a patient goes back to sinus rhythm spontaneously, they still have a prolonged QT interval and the propensity for torsade to occur again. And the danger is, if a patient has more sustained torsade, it might not revert to sinus, but may instead degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. Magnesium is a treatment given to reduce the propensity of triggering or re-triggering torsade and to avoid the rhythm degenerating to V-fib. Now, anytime a patient has a funky fast rhythm and is hemodynamically unstable with torsade, the treatment is going to be electrical cardioversion. But it's possible for a patient to have short intermittent runs of torsades 
to be hemodynamically stable early on with torsades or to have just been shocked out of torsades, and that's when we'd give magnesium. Magnesium works by blocking calcium channels, and it's calcium current through L-type calcium channels that's responsible for the early after depolarizations that can trigger or re-trigger torsade. So if we block or reduce early after depolarization, we're preventing torsade. Note, however, that this doesn't necessarily correct the QT prolongation causing this issue in the first place. We're only reducing the likelihood of a complication of that QT prolongation. Well, that discussion of antidysrhythmic drugs went on a lot longer than I had expected since it's mostly covered elsewhere in this series. Oh well, I'll be seeing you around.